Welcome into the Odds and Audibles podcast. Uh, I'm Matt Prem, Eric Scopel, Jared Mack on the show. And today we are proud to have, for the first time, uh, Dan Lanning, the Oregon football program head coach of the Ducks. Dan, thanks for coming on the show. How are you doing? Doing great. Yeah, thanks for having me. Spring football's in a break, so we figured this is a good time to get you on. Um, you recently were given a citation of achievement by your alma mater. Before we dive into Oregon football, you were back at school. What was that like? Uh, what was your message uh, to your to the students at, at uh, your alma mater? I'm sure that was a pretty proud moment. Yeah, it was a fun experience. Um, you know, you're on. I'm, I'm, I was fortunate enough to be on the stage there with some people that really had some um, impressive accomplishments over their professional careers. You know, was was on stage there with a surgeon, doctor, um, uh, on stage with a, a judge. I felt a little out of place because I was a football coach, you know. But uh, overall, it was it was um, a fun experience. I think it's important when you get to have some success that you get an opportunity to give back and go back um, and, you know, kind of pay it forward. And uh, just kidding, it's a small school, um, but it's a school that did a lot for me and wanted to make sure I had a chance to, you know, share what little things I could share that I thought might be beneficial to some of those students. But ultimately just talked about, you know, believing in what you're passionate about and doing something that you're passionate for. Uh, I think that'll lead to success in life. Um, you know, the karma is real. M make sure you take the time to give back. Um, and then ultimately don't, don't live with regrets. So, uh, it's kind of really what, what a lot of my message was. Dan, as, as Matt said, thank you so much for joining us and, uh, for, for your first show, let's hope it's not your last. Let's hope this goes well enough that we'll have you on as a repeat guest. Um, I'm actually going to start with a follow-up to the very first question I asked you at your introductory press conference where I, where I asked you why you're ready to be a head football coach. You probably remember this and you had the quick line of, ah, actually, you got your facts wrong. I, this isn't my first football head coaching job or my first head coaching job. I was a uh, high school basketball coach or, or you were in high school and you coached a third grade basketball team. You yeah. said you were, you're damn good. And I've had a, a long time wanting to know more details about this experience, Dan. So uh, <laughs> tell us why you were so darn good and, and, and maybe maybe why maybe that was something that maybe got you into coaching. I don't know how good we really were. I think that was, that was like a slight flex. We had a good, we had a good team. We had fun. Um, I think it was part of National Honor Society. You had to get some community service hours, which I'm really grateful. You know, now sitting on this side where you're a part of some organizations that require you to do something that gives back. It's why we're so involved in community service here at Oregon. You know, we look for opportunities to, again, pay it forward to do. We, we've done a lot of over hundreds of hours of, of community service just this this semester for our football team. But I think that's kind of how it started is on one of the organizations I was a part of, you had to do some community service. And my uh, little brother was, you know, he was playing basketball. I thought it'd be fun if me and one of my teammates signed up to be the coaches for his basketball team. Um, and I think it's just a great, a great opportunity to learn that um, communication is really key. When you, when, you, when you coach a young team, everything you say, you know, how they take those words, I mean, something that might not be confusing to you can be really confusing to a third grader. So I think it really taught me early on, anybody that's coached a youth basketball team or baseball team quickly learns how important your words are and how you word something, uh, you know, uh, is important because it can be, it's open to translation and translation by a third grader is a little bit different than translation from an adult. So I think I learned early how to communicate. Um, well, um, I think I learned some of the traits that are really important for a coach as far as making sure the fun of the game still exists um, when you're coaching. I think I, I threw off, you know, a lot of third graders early on when we started doing condi conditioning at third grade practices um, <laughs> and they weren't necessarily anticipating having to run up and down the floor. But you're able to instill some early thoughts of, you know, what it takes to be successful. But that was a fun experience for me. Uh, certainly something I wouldn't change. Dan, I'd like to thank you for coming on the pod again. I'm the third guy to do it, but thank you no matter what. Uh, I got another question about Oregon football, but not specifically to this timeline. Uh, before taking the job at Oregon, becoming a head coach, is there something you look back on now that you've had over a year of experience here that was a specific, uh, memorable advice that you got from, I don't know, somebody that was at Georgia, was at your time before, but just a specific advice that you got from somebody who's helped you through this first year and a half or so? I've leaned on so many people, Jared, like, um, I mean, I, I, and I still do, you know, I, I still am, am making phone calls to, to Kirby or Sam Pittman or Mel Tucker. It's just, I, I continually look for 
um, ways to adjust and grow um, and improve. Um, so no, I can't, I can't say that I've leaned on one thing or one particular advice. I think the one thing that I've gotten probably more from observing than doing is just, you have to be yourself in this process. You can't be somebody else. Um, and I, I've really tried to stick to that. I've also, a lot of people will tell you that head coaches, when they become head coaches, they change. Right. And, uh, I wanted, that was really important to me that I was kind of who I, who I am the entire time, but that, that hasn't changed. You know, you still have to have those same standards. Certainly you can't be the guy, um, that, uh, you know, is highs and lows or, are you know, conflicting and you have to hold everybody, the organization into a standard or to a standard, but I like to make sure that that stand, that same standard exists for me, you know? So, um, but ultimately that's probably what I would lean on the most is you have to be you. Yeah. You've had an interesting road to becoming a head coach. You drove across the country for a GA job. Um, you've been at some places where the support and maybe the facilities, the uniforms are nowhere near what you're at now. I mean, Oregon's kind of the Mecca of, of all of that. How much has that road to get here shaped you and to who you are? Like you're just talking about not changing as a head coach and just, was there ever a point in time when you were like, am I really doing this? Like, should I be doing this for your career? Oh, for sure. Um, yeah, I wouldn't trade one. Now, looking back, I wouldn't trade one piece of my journey to get here. Um, I've certainly been blessed by good opportunity. I think I always tell young coaches now, um, what I always looked for was opportunity, not necessarily uh, reward, right? Opportunity for experience, opportunity for growth. And that really paid dividends. I also always wanted to be a part of a winner. So kind of every one of my coaching moves, I, I tried to make sure that I was going somewhere where we were going to win and have success. Um, and I try to make decisions based on those two things, opportunity and success, rather than title, um, rather than paycheck. And that certainly has paid off for me. Not making money for a long time in this profession um, has really benefited me, you know, now um, because I'm, I'm not I'm not married to it. That's not why I do it. That's not for me. That's certainly not the motivation. Um, the opportunity and the success is really the motivation for me. But, um, yeah, I can remember really probably the biggest time that I questioned it was I just finished my first year GA at, at Pittsburgh. Um, it was a really hard year. We weren't, I was probably the least successful team that I've been a part of since we were there. We went to a bowl game, um, year one, a transition coach Graham's first year there. He left after the season to go to Arizona state and become the head coach. And, uh, as a GA, they don't really pay for your moves. Right. So when, when the head coach takes a job and he goes somewhere else, if assistant coaches go there, they're, they're going to pay for the move. And I just remember being in Pittsburgh, already being a long way away from our family in Kansas City, and now having to drive from Pittsburgh to, to Phoenix um, after the bowl game to take a job. I remember my wife and I packing up our U-Haul truck. I remember like selling couches and stuff, just trying to kind of piece together, you know, hey, how are we going to pay for this U-Haul to go from Pittsburgh to Arizona where we're still not going to make any money, right, to be a GA? Um, and I remember that drive being really, really long from Pittsburgh all the way to Phoenix. You know, we, we, we made a stop along the way. I think we stopped in Kansas City first just because that was kind of along the way um, and then stopped again somewhere in New Mexico um, on the way out to Arizona. But during that drive, I certainly was sitting here saying, hey, being a high school coach wasn't that bad. Maybe that's something we should think about because, you know, you're making more money. You're a decision maker rather than being on the bottom of the totem pole. Um, but also on that same drive, I remember saying to myself, okay, look, that was Dan at Pittsburgh. Now I got a chance to be Dan in, in Arizona and I get to be the best version of me. Like nope, everybody I'm about to go meet here at Arizona, they've never seen me before besides the coaches coach before. So I can reinvent myself. I can be the best version of me. And that's the one thing I've kind of learned from every single stop is whatever your weaknesses were at the last place, those don't have to be your same weaknesses at the next place. You can attack those weaknesses and kind of reinvent yourself and, Somewhere along that U-Haul drive, um, you know, I remember making that decision, you know, to, to be a, a better version of myself. And I've kind of taken that same philosophy every step uh, of my journey. One of those versions of Dan was Dan at Alabama with that 2015 coaching staff, which is kind of a stuff of legends, six or seven head coaches, you yourself included. Do you have any special memories about that staff? I asked this to Wilson Love as well when he was on the podcast. Just 
any memories or any time you look back and say, wow, like I was, I was a part of that staff that, you know, produced that many head coaches, that many DCs and OCs. Yeah. I just remember my first experience just in general at Alabama um, of the way the organization operated, just kind of being in awe of how it was really, you know, really well pieced together and uh, something we kind of pride ourselves off now of, you know, the strategy behind how you operate day in and day out, the analysis that happens after the fact, after something happens, the quality control of writing a report after you did something, how you can do it better. Um, and just really the consistency that Coach Saban operated with day in and day out. And then going back, I, I remember, you know, that fir fir first staff being there and being just in awe of, wow, everybody on the staff's like elite. Like there's mm -hmm. great coaches across the board. And up to that point, I had kind of always coached it in really good places, but I'd always had that one guy that I said, okay, wait, that gives me hope. If that guy can make it, I can make it. You know what I mean? Wherever you're at, you're kind of like, oh, wait, that guy's, uh, you know, a, a division one uh, football coach or whatever it is. Like, okay, I got a chance. I can be, I can be successful too. And when you got to Alabama, you're like, it, it made sense why every single person was there. And then how demanding Coach Saban was, you know, what he was able to get out of that group. Um, was just really, really impressive. And uh, I took a lot of it. I always tell people, you know, when I went there, I was taking a pay cut to go to Alabama, but I went there to get my doctorate in football. And I feel like that's kind of what I did is I walked away with an education um, and learned stuff that year that I'd never learned before. Dan, we hear you talk a lot about the growth mindset. And I'm wondering, does that predate football? I'm just curious what the origination of that is. Is that something you took from another coach? Is that something you took from maybe mom and dad growing up? Or, or kind of what's where did that come from? And why is that such a pillar for, for you as a coach in your programs? Yeah, I mean, um, over time, you know, both, both my parents are teachers. And I think that they've always built a culture of being lifelong learners just in our household. You know, we, um, we were the family that would do like family vacations and go explore different places and go to national parks and learn. My dad was a science teacher. My mom was an English teacher. Um, you know, if, if mom was driving the car, dad was reading a book to the, to our family or vice versa. So I just, I feel like that's kind of something that's been instilled to me from the beginning. Um, and then ultimately when you get around the best, when you're around great coaches and you realize that it's not so much that they're set in their ways, they are set in consistency but they're not set in their ways. They're looking on how they can improve, how they can grow. That's something I always wanted to make sure that was part of our program and the direction we're headed. Speaking of your program, uh, it's spring football. I guess not right now, but in a couple of weeks, we'll be back on the field. What's your favorite drill that, that you guys run? Like what makes it so informative or, or positive for you? What, what's, what's that one drill that you just love doing? Um. I mean, inside runs fun, but that's 11 on 11. When you start about like talking about breaking, um, you know, yeah, team run drill. But when you start breaking into smaller groups, there's a drill that we call mod bracket drill. It's basically a perimeter blocking drill um, where guys on the perimeter have to block and, and guys on defense have to beat blocks and then make tackles. It can get pretty physical. Um, that's a fun drill to see guys compete. It's you and another man on an island in space. Uh, and you got to go, got to go there and operate. Dan, before the season last year, you said that you had a game day playlist. Yet, you didn't, you didn't go into that playlist. So I am now giving you the floor to go into this playlist. I want, I want to hear what you listen to before the games. Let me pull it up on my phone. There's a lot Please of different do. stuff on here. Uh, I kind of take you as like an '80s rock guy. Is that true? No, not no. true. All right, so. <laughs> Um, I mean, it's literally everywhere. Like you got Master P, Bourbon's Cadillac, or uh, and Lax, <laughs> but then you got Counting Crows, Colorblind, oh. Lil Wayne, okay. Drop the World, D12, <laughs> um, Jadakiss, Mad World. You probably don't know that song. Michael Andrews, Gary Jules. Good I like, yeah, yeah, yes. I mean, it's a little bit everywhere. Trick Daddy, Rick Ross, oh. YG, Bush. I got Bush on there. Um, no swallowed. I don't know how linger from cranberries made it on this list, but it's on there. <laughs> uh, J. Cole, yeah. Uh Johnny Cash. I mean, it's a little bit everywhere, as you can see. Lil Troy, Nas. Mm. Uh, That's a good addition. Last of Mohicans. I think everybody knows that's on my on there for me. Like theme. Oh, so yeah, yeah. Young Buck, Two Chains. Um Probably a little more rap on here than I anticipated. 
Pusher T. That's a good Man. game. Music. Push. It's a good yeah. music right there. So, uh, but yeah, a little bit everywhere. I actually have like a former player. There's a guy named Han Solo that played for me at Sam Houston State. It's got Han a couple Solo. good songs. Han Solo. Um, he's got some stuff that's, that's pretty good. So, yeah, a little bit everywhere. Big crit. I mean, but not a lot of not a lot of '80s rock, unfortunately. Yeah. That's on. Oh, that's on like my fire. I've got I've got some '80s rock on my like boat playlist. I got you got different playlists, right? Like I got a boat yeah. playlist. I got a fireworks playlist. Like you got your playlist for fireworks, like the Fourth of July. I've got uh, golf playlist. You know, mm. yeah. So it depends on what you're doing. That was really close to being on our a question we didn't ask. I'm really happy we kept that one in, Jared. <laughs> yeah, you guys you almost removed that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was close. I wanted to ask it. I wanted to ask it. Yeah, we, we we had a long meeting before this. What we wanted to keep in that was that was kind of on the that was really on the verge of being on the. You didn't think I'd ball. open it up and tell you, did you? you no, no, <laughs> not at all. No. I wasn't. Yeah, I guess I did. Uh, maybe this probably doesn't segue great into the next one, but uh, a little bit off topic, but onto kind of more of answering and asking questions. Um, this is one I'm just curious on. We do a lot of talking and most of it's us asking you questions, you answering. What do we ask you too much about and what don't we ask you enough about? Here's an opportunity for you to opine about maybe some things that you'd like us to, to check in on more on. Maybe things yeah, that you, you can criticize stop. us for the first time. Yeah, um, good question. I mean, it, like... <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I, I would say like the injury questions and the scholarship number questions are kind of like, why? what's the point? It doesn't matter. We're going to have 11 guys on the field. I get it. It's yeah. the part that's interesting to everybody, but we're going to play with the best that we have available. I certainly get tired of those questions. And I don't, I always feel like when you're answering those questions, it doesn't give us an advantage. So I'd rather you guys ask questions that give the Oregon Ducks an advantage, not our opponent, right? Um, what do you guys not ask enough about? You know, I don't know. I mean, you guys do a pretty good job of having a variety of questions. You know, maybe it's just personal stories within each player, you know, I mean, uh, or staff member, you know, something unique to each one of those. Do we ask you enough about PFF? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> enough. Yeah, certainly enough. Uh, we're speaking with Dan Lanning, uh, the head coach of the Oregon football program here on the Odds and Audibles podcast. Dan, during our our media interactions here. You talk a lot about reviewing practice film, reviewing game film, just an estimate. I, I just want to ask like how many hours a week do you think you put into game film and reviewing all that stuff? And is there the biggest, who's the biggest film junkie on staff for you guys? Yeah. I'd have a hard time answering that question. You know, like during seasons, a different mode, but you're up here watching film from the beginning of the day until you know, late at night. And it's really just about like, how much can you jam in? It's imagine like um, cramming for a test, right? Like five days out of the seven day week, you know, and as you get down closer to the end, you're a little bit more prepared, obviously. But it, from the beginning, you just start to absorb it and watch as much as you can. As far as junkies, I don't think I could pick, I don't think I could pick one guy. we got a lot of guys that really pour into film and, you know, you want to use film to be your, you know, your litmus test. It's your, it's like, it's the, it's how you check and answer boxes. Like you have a kind of a check sheet of things that you want to look for. You know, what does the team do best? Where are their strengths? Where are their weaknesses? And the only way you can answer those questions is by watching as much film as possible. Right. And you want to try to find some of the easy answers and provide easy answers for your players. And you really can't do that without studying film. And, you know, football is so unique because there's so many moving parts, you know, even, you know, and, and basketball, it's five on five. We talk about 11 on 11, the variables, the change of possession plays, <clears throat> the amount of variables you have to have a good staff that does a good job of pouring in. And all you're trying to do is take complicated things and make them really simple for your players and have simple solutions that can be complicated for your opponent, right? But you don't do that unless you pour hours and hours of time into film and have a process. Dan, you were just talking about maybe solving for on-field things. I'm curious on, let's say for you personally, like, game management clock management things that you want to work on there how like how are you practically working on that during a week in practice is are, are there ways you do that or are there things outside of practice i'm just curious because that's one of those things i think um I, I i have a hard time understanding of like okay like maybe the clock maybe you don't like how you did this there this th maybe this here how are you actually going back and, and, and working to improve upon that yeah it's two, twofold to me you can create those situations in the meeting room so watch a situation with your staff from a tv copy um 
and and say, okay, pause the pause it and say, okay, what are we doing here, right? And actually replaying a scenario uh, that's maybe already existed. And then the hard part in football is you're always preparing for situations that you don't know will exist in that game, right? You know that in the last two minutes, the way you manage the clock is really critical, but you don't know exactly, are they going to throw an incomplete pass on the first? Are you up three? Are you down four? So we try to recreate those scenarios in practice. So, you know, for, we'll do move the field periods. So, for example, put the ball at the minus 25. There's a minute 28 left. You have one timeout. We'll officiate it with officials just like you would in a game, and then you let it play. You play it out. All right, first down, all right, clock's running, and let the clock work just as it would in a game. But I think the biggest piece is trying to recreate those moments within practice, and then you kind of have a checklist of, okay, have we gotten enough four-minute scenarios? All right, get the ball back scenarios. Have we done enough? Um, all right, we've got tw- 10 seconds left. Do we have time for two plays? Right, what do those two plays look like? And recreating those scenarios in practice and in the meeting room. So we'll do in the meeting room with our coaches, you know, throughout the week. Um, we'll do it on the practice field multiple times and then educating your players, right? We'll play, you know, Fridays, we play a lot of scenarios out on the screen that maybe we weren't able to practice in practice, right? So at least we've gone over it with our players we, we like to pull film from the NFL, from other college teams. So even if it hasn't a situation that hasn't happened to us, but it's happened to someone else, we can still coach that situation. If that makes sense. So we'll show an example of the Kansas City Chiefs being in a similar scenario or, um, you know, another team in college football being in a similar scenario and how they handled it. And then the ultimate goal is that you can ask your players how you would handle it or we should handle it, and they know the answer, right? And that's what, you know – the big piece I think in coaching is always checking for understanding, you know, nobody really, I'm going to play zero snaps next year for the ducks. So it doesn't matter if I know how to handle it. The question is when this ball's in flight, does our punt returner know how to make that decision um, before the ball hits the ground, what the reaction is, what it should look like um, and be able to go from there. The transfer portals, obviously very useful for every school. Um, It can fill gaps, build depth. You've found talent. Both, you know, both classes that's been been there for you. Um, there's also thousands of players in the portal every year. What are the traits you have to see in a guy to, just to have the interest to even decide to to Hey, we're going to try and get this guy. Like, what are you looking for? What are the traits that you're you're building off of? I think the big piece that it has to start with, maybe even more so in the portal than anywhere else, is you have to try to have intimate ties that you can get great character evaluation. Right, because guys that you can pull out of the portal, there's a lot of unknowns if you don't do uh, a diligent job finding research. Obviously, in coaching, you have so many networks, so many people that you can reach out to. But a lot of times, especially players that are leaving other programs that are talented enough to come to Oregon and play, most of the time that other program didn't want to lose them. If they did want to lose them, then that's probably a red flag, right? Um, if they didn't, um, that means they might not give you accurate information about the player. So how else can you find that accurate information? There's very few high school coaches that won't say wonderful things about their players, right? And that's not a knock on high school coaches, but you want guys that can be honest. Um, They really know too. So figuring out how you can find that intimate information. And then also, also, you know, there's a a different standard of play here. So can this guy really come here and be an impact? You know, when we talk about bringing guys in um, through the portal, we're not, we're not looking generally to bring guys in for depth. We're looking for guys that can make an impact. Um, Whereas you might take, somebody early on in their career and, and have a developmental plan to get them ready for year two or year three on the football field. There's not a lot of year two, year three, you know, development pieces when you're talking about portal guys. Dan, you guys are planning on bringing in 39 new members to this 2023 class. So don't worry, not a scholarship math question here. Just, I'm wondering, is this going to be like, maybe not a universally standard, but a kind of a standard number that you guys plan on bringing in for recruiting classes going forward? Or you think this is more of a, uh, like uh, taking over the roster in the way that you want to year? Yeah, probably a little higher year, year one. If you think about this, kind of the first full year, um, we probably have more transition this year than we will necessarily in the future. So the numbers are going to be higher than 25. Always. It used to be 25. We're always going right. to look to enhance our program and make it better. But um 39 is probably a little bit high. So somewhere between 25 and 39 is probably more of a target. You, you, but you don't know, right? Like, what, what do we know about college football? It's changing every day. You better be able to adapt. Mm-hmm. You don't know who you're going to lose, who you're going to gain, who will declare early. So you want to be prepared for all those moments. 
I'm going to ask you about another thing, Dan, that you mentioned in your introductory, which was that notepad app you said on your phone where you had a list of coaches. Um, I'm curious, like, why was that a thing you felt was worthwhile? What did somebody need to do to, to earn the right to be on your list? And just like how many guys have you hired, would you say that have been, do you have to be on the list to be, be, a, be somebody you hire or, or, or is that a rec prerequisite or kind of what's the, the role that has in the whole thing? Um, no, you don't have to be on the list to be a guy to hire. Um, but I think that, you know, how do you earn a way on the list? You just, it's different things for each guy, but you're looking for elite traits of guys, of people that make great coaches. To me, a lot of times this transcends positionally. Um, like if a guy can coach, a guy can coach. It doesn't matter if he's the running backs coach or an O-line coach. Um, you see traits that are like, okay, this makes this guy unique. Um, ultimately, all the guys on my list, I feel like are really elite in relationships and have a tireless work ethic, right? If you're lazy, you're going to have a hard time being on the list, right? And there's some phenomenal coaches that are really, really smart that don't put in great effort. But the one thing you know about college football is you can outwork people. And I want to outwork people. So you have to hire people that work really hard. Um, I think, you know, being humble um, and, uh, you know, understanding that you don't always have the answers, right? Having room to grow. I think that's an important trait for people that have been on that list for me. Um, I'd say now that I'm in this role, I haven't kept that list up to date as much. And I probably need to keep doing that. So that's a good reminder for me about <laughs> going in there and critiquing it. But it's, I mean, it's still a really big list. What, what's probably just as important is there's a lot of guys in that list that I definitely would love to hire that I can't because there's limitations on how many you you can hire and have on your staff. So um, it's a long list. Yeah, people can get added and subtracted. But unless there's been people that were on the list that I thought I had right, and then I had interactions with them later on mm. in my career that I said, ah, you know what, this guy's not a great fit. He probably doesn't fit. And then maybe they got removed. Or maybe they're good in, in a role, but you have multiple guys that fit that. Um, but that's good. That's what you want, right? That means the next time you move on that you can kind of promote uh, from that list. You guys had to make a couple hires this offseason to replace Adrian, to replace Matt Powers, to replace Kenny. I'm wondering if you could bring us at least like maybe a Cliff Notes version of your hiring process. Like who, who are guys you're reaching out to? Who are guys that you're talking to? Someone obviously like Rob Mullins for the AD, but just what that process looks like from your end of the spectrum. Well, I mean, information is king. Um, just like in the portal, you, you try to find intimate knowledge of the people that you're going to be working with. Uh, you don't want to be closed minded in the sense of, Every time there's transition on your staff, you want to look for it as an opportunity to grow and how you can improve. Um, also for us, we always want to be driven by the ability to promote within, right? So when given the opportunity, we'd like to be able to develop talent here in-house and grow talent to where they can move into roles when it fits. Um, and we still want to be able to do that, you know, and in each one of those guys' case, we felt like we had some really intimate knowledge of the guys that we were uh, visiting with. Sometimes you interview a lot of guys, one, because you're interested in interviewing a lot of guys, two, because you're interested in becoming a better coach and you want to know what other people know. So, uh, you know, the interview process is a great place to learn, get ideas. Um, sometimes that equates to hiring a guy. Sometimes it's just an opportunity to figure out what somebody else knows and how you can get better. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the process is different for each one. Sometimes you can move fast. Sometimes you can move slow. I'd say one thing that I've learned is we have an elite staff, and if we lose – one person, I don't have to move fast to be wrong, right? I can move fast and be right, but I don't have to move fast because somebody on a message board somewhere says, they better get this hired tomorrow or we're not, we're going to lose out on a kid. Not really. No, like we recruit as an entire staff. Um, it's not one person. Um, and one person is never going to affect what we do as an organization. We have to make decisions based on, I mean, there's over 130 players on our team, right? Outside of, you know, scholarship players, you know, one person, uh, in the recruiting process isn't going to dictate what we do from a hiring sequence and how we can improve our entire organization. So I'm really, really pleased with the guys we brought in. I think they all bring unique experience, um, special knowledge to our program. And, you know, that's the one thing I think you have to do as a leader is you can't be afraid to hire guys that you think might be smarter than you or have some ideas that can uh, grow you as well as a coach. Tonight, uh, I'll be at Matt Nine Arena, and I can guarantee you Dane Altman after the game is going to reference how many deflections that his team gets in a basketball game. It's a stat that doesn't show up in the stat sheet, but it's really important to his team. Uh, is there something like that on a foot in, in a scale for football that doesn't show up on the box score that during practice or during games that you guys just really track and, and view as critical for your team's success on the field? 
Yeah, uh, most things in football are tracked, you know, so that it, it, it is going to show up, um, I would say. But, you know, we, we talk about havoc rate a little bit on defense, and it's just, you know, I think – it's really your ability to affect the quarterback, right? But the percentage of plays that you're going to create a negative play, right? An interception, a forced fumble, right? Uh, a batted ball, right? I think sometimes a batted ball from a defensive lineman goes as an unseen play, right? Or an uncharted play. I think the stat that probably won't show up um, is hidden yardage on special teams. Like a lot of times you might not realize, like let's say the punter kicks a punt, okay? And we fair catch that punt but the punter generally kicks a 40 yard punt and we charge the ball and we fair catch it at 30 yards. In my mind, that's a 10 yard return, right? But on, and statistically it's gonna be a zero yard return, yeah. right? It's a fair catch, but we just saved Game 10 yards game. of hidden yardage, right? Because right. we caught the ball in the air. So I think hidden yardage in special teams, really important. A lot of times, you know, your, your return team might have a negative impact from how many yards they actually get. They average less yards per return but that's not necessarily indicative of starting field position or how many yards they were able to swing it, or you were able to make the punter kick a bad kick because of the pressure you applied. But I think affecting the quarterback, affecting in the kicking game are two areas that that, that can definitely show up. Last one for me, Dan, and thank you again so much for, for joining us here. Uh, I think a thing you said on Saturday kind of stuck out when you were talking about Jeff Bossa and his progress. And you mentioned that the defense from year one to two, will get easier for a player like Jeff. I, I'm just curious on, on the why behind that. Why, why is this defense something where there might be some growth you see um, from, from year one to year two with, and being involved with it? In college football today, your defense has to be multiple and have answers, right? Which means if they change the formation, if they change the structure of the formation, the defense has to change, right? Well, when you're talking about changes, you know, consistently within plays, within motions, I mean, right now in the morning we're doing – you know, because we're not really in spring ball, we're doing projects, crossover projects. So our entire offensive team and our entire defensive team, I'm talking about really our coaches, are presenting from the other side perspective. Like, hey, here's things that you guys do that are difficult for us and vice versa. Here's things that we do that are difficult for you. Um, things that show up in college football. We're studying other teams that are explosive or other teams that create negative plays. And you want to be able to decimate that information and get it to your players. Well, obviously another year, in a system, you know, especially for a guy like Jeff that made a position change when he got here, going from safety to linebacker, now having to learn a new defense. Year two, when he already knows, hey, here's why we like some of these checks. He's thinking about it a little bit more almost from a coach perspective rather than a player. Um, I think it's a lot easier to solve issues. It's no different than, you know, year two Spanish compared to year one Spanish, right? It's still the same language, right? But uh, there's a few more intricacies that go into putting together a sentence or writing a paper. When spring ball's over, what's next for, for this staff? I, I think that's always been like the biggest like question. Like what, what there's a three month lull or so about recruiting's <laughs> always going on. I, I, say, I don't that. know what lull you're talking about, Matt. Recruit. <laughs> like that's the that's it. Like, the, like uh, self-assess, recap, what does spring ball look like? Where are our strengths? Where are our weaknesses? Right. Apply that information to the team that you have, which we don't know our team until we play football. Right. So we got to go play football to see what our strengths and weaknesses are, reassess that, evaluate that. Um, then we'll start some of our summer scouting report projects where we start putting together initial game plans for next year's opponent. That way you're not doing it in a seven-day window during the week of a game. You're able to pull back on information you gathered in the summer and then recruiting, recruiting and evaluation. How many camps can we get to to see players? How many times can we get guys on our campus? Right, We have to get elite players on our campus to be able to sign them up um, You know, come, come December. Cool. Well, you and answered. then July, July, there's the lull. You get like a little bit of a window there around July 4th where we get to like see our kids yeah. and stuff. That's <laughs> that's important. <laughs> that's really important. Very. Um, Dan, thanks for coming on the show. We really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, hopefully sometime down the road, we'll get you back on the show. If not, it's been a good run. Hey, it's a good <laughs> run. Appreciate you guys. Maybe next year. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you, Dan. Work, work <laughs> guys. Have a good one. Thank you. You too.